Hi everyone, it's Saoirse, and I am coming at you today with a book from my class. Now I know I talked about this class before, and I already covered the Bell Jar and Valette, which are on the reading list for this class. It's Literature Reading and Mental Health, and it's my option course as part of my master's. So this book is called An Unquiet Mind, A Memoir of Moods and Madness, and it's by K. Redfield Jameson. I also have a cat on my lap today, so things could get really crazy because I haven't clipped his claws in a while. And they're digging into my knees. That's fine. Here, you can take a look, I think. There he is. He's a good boy. Okay, so, ooh, that's too high. Hi. Um, so, I'm just going to read the back. Um, first, let me say, obviously I was very excited because this is a memoir and I'm obsessed with memoir. Um, <clears throat> I'll just tell you what it says. Dr. K. Redfield Jameson is one of the foremost authorities on manic depression or bipolar disorder and has, I didn't, that's not like saying it doesn't exist, that's just in brackets, and has experienced its terrors and cruel allure firsthand. While pursuing her career in medicine, she was affected by the same exhilarating highs and catastrophic lows that afflicted many of her patients. From her jubilant childhood to the disquiet that has dominated her adult life, she charts a journey through her own mind and those of others. So, really fascinating just from the beginning, um, knowing that she is a doctor, that she spent most of her professional life studying uh, bipolar disorder. She, she refers to it throughout the whole thing as manic depressive illness, um, and that's, I think, partly because it was published in 1995, so the nomenclature has sort of changed in, in medicine, um, but you probably hear me say manic depression more, and it's because that's what she calls it. Um, so, yeah, memoir. I, I find it so compelling because, I don't know, it just moves me more because I know that it's real. And it's not that I haven't been moved by fiction, of course, like, hi, Lord of the Rings and Harry Potter, but there's something about knowing that this person who wrote this is brave enough to put this down on paper, um, especially with Dr. Jameson because she knew that this could really hurt her career, you know, that she could possibly be um, taken out of her position for this, um, for being open about it, because what would people think if somebody with manic depression was trying to treat people with manic depression? It really goes into the the questions of that, like, what, how do we feel about um, people with mental illness treating others? Um, and as it turns out, we don't need to be so worried, because they absolutely can, and there's a point in here that I thought was great that she was afraid she was going to be fired from this position, and this doctor said if we got rid of everybody that works here who has uh, manic depression or depression or anxiety, um, we would not have a very big staff, and it would be a much less interesting staff. So let me just read and talk about some of the lines in here that stood out to me. Page numbers are hard, you guys. They're just hard to find. <sighs> Much like crossing the Bay Bridge when there is a storm over the Chesapeake, one may be terrified to go forward, but there is no question of going back. I find myself somewhat inevitably taking a certain solace in Robert Lowell's essential question, yet why not say what happened? And I just love that because it's true. We can't go back. So in going forward, we have to grow with our experiences. We have to learn to grow with our trauma. And this is what I love about memoir, that, that you get to just say, look, this is me. I can't change it, so I'm going to talk about it in the hopes that maybe it'll help other people. Um, and that's why I love to write memoir. And hopefully, you know, I'll be published one day. That's, yeah, <laughs> that would be cool. But, you know, that's like a one in a million chance. This is a quote from Hugo Wolf. It says, I appear at times merry and in good heart, talk to before others quite reasonably, and it looks as if I felt too, God knows how well within my skin. Yet the soul maintains its deathly sleep and the heart bleeds from a thousand wounds. And I think this is a great way to say, you have no idea what anybody's going through. 
on any given day, at any moment when you see them, you have no clue what's in their head, what's in their heart, if they're coping with something in a way that is working or if not. And I feel really strongly about this because I get told so often um, that I must be so happy. Aren't you so happy? Like, your life is great. You Look at all the things you've done. And, and nobody stops to think, it doesn't matter what you've accomplished or what you see other people accomplish. Like, it doesn't change what's in your head. And the people who have accomplished the most or seem like they should be the happiest to you, they could be the saddest people in the world. You have no idea. And especially when somebody is open and talks about having depression, as I do, to be told, oh, well, you should be happy. I think you look happy. So you're happy, right? Like, because that's the only way that they can deal with it, you know? It just isn't right. You have to understand that everybody has their own battle all the time. And it's really best to just listen to what people say about themselves and believe they're being honest. And, but you know, sometimes people try to do the opposite and say that they're doing better than they are, so you can't really just take everything at face value. Really the best thing is to just check on people, check on your friends, check on your family, and, and be there for them in any way that you can. And don't just say, oh, they're fine because I think they're fine, or because they say that they're fine, so don't need to worry about anything. Um, this book, so, it brought up so many interesting and controversial points. Um, at one point she's working with another doctor and um, they both have a mental illness and she said, somehow, like so many people who get depressed, we felt our depressions were more complicated and existentially based than they actually were. Antidepressants might be indicated for psychiatric patients, for those of weaker stock, but not for us. It was a costly attitude. Our upbringing and pride held us hostage. Yeah. I think that's... That's a really important topic because there is... Well, there's always going to be a stigma, well, hopefully not always, but there is a stigma about um, getting help and which ways you decide to get help, and honestly, it doesn't matter, as long as you're getting help. You want to try medication? Great. You want to try just therapy? Great. But don't listen to what other people tell you about, like, it's, it makes you weak to take medication. It, according to her, is the only thing that keeps her alive. Um, and, like, she's prescribed lithium to help with manic depression, and without it, she's out of control, and it ruined so many aspects of her life that she couldn't control because she refused to take the lithium or refused to take the right dose. Um, and then once she finally found the correct dose, which ended up being like a little bit lower than what they originally said, she could finally see things clearly, think clearly, not get into deep depressions for weeks at a time. So it's really just about finding what works for you. And, and the same thing does not work for everybody. I should preface all of this by saying, I am not a doctor. Okay. What am I... No, I put the wrong page number. Okay. So she talks about how she gets, uh, she buys a horse because she thinks that'll help. Um, like, you know, like a therapy horse. But she likes horse riding. Um, so she says, in the clouds and silver linings department, Whenever I rode him, I was generally too terrified to be depressed. And when I was manic, I had no judgment anyway, so maniacal riding was well suited to the mood. I just thought that was a bit fun. I mean, she does have like some lighthearted moments because you can't, like you take your, your illness seriously, but I don't want to say you can't let it control your whole life, but it, it is good to be able to find those silver linings, um, especially when they're the hardest to find and you don't even want to look for them. 68. Oh yeah. Um, she says, which of the, which of my feelings are real? Which of the me's is me? 
the wild, impulsive, chaotic, energetic, and crazy one, or the shy, withdrawn, desperate, suicidal, doomed, and tired one. Probably a bit of both. Hopefully much that is neither. Virginia Woolf, in her dives and climbs, said it all. How far do our feelings take their color from the dive underground? I mean, what is the reality of any feeling? I just thought that was interesting. It's like, um, she talks about Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, too, in this. And it must be so scary to not really know um, which part of you is the real you. And and she talks about her struggle with taking medication and, and not wanting to because she's afraid that she's going to lose who she really is. So is she really somebody who's manic? Is she really somebody who's depressed? Or is she really this person who's dulled with um, too much medication? And it took her many, many years to find out. Let's see. 114. Okay. Oh, this is just another one of those things that that we need to work on it. And again, this is an older book. It's from 95. But still, like, the way that we talk about mental illness needs to change. Within psychiatric circles, if you kill yourself, you earn the right to be considered a successful suicide. This is a success one can live without. Suicidal depression, I decided in the midst of my indescribably awful 18-month bout of it, is God's way of keeping manics in their place. It works. Profound melancholia is a day in, day out, night in, night out, almost arterial level of agony. It is a pitiless, unrelenting pain that affords no window of hope, no alternative to a grim and brackish existence, and no respite from the cold undercurrents of thoughts and feeling that dominate the horribly restless nights of despair. So it was really interesting to read about mania um, in this book because I feel like I've read a lot about depression and anxiety, but hearing her talk about the way that she would be so high for a while on this in this manic part of her illness and then she would come down so low and she would be in, in these desperate depressions it's really really just scary and she describes it really well in this book so I'll leave a lot of, her, of it for you to discover for yourself oh I love this description my friend kept a constant watch on me, drew my blood for lithium and electrolyte levels, and walked me repeatedly to pull me out of my drugged state, as one would move a sick shark around its tank, in order to keep the water circulating through its gills. Good one. Um, she says, grief, fortunately, is very different from depression. It is sad, it is awful, but it is not without hope. And I think this is such an important distinction to make um, because often I've found, at least in my experience, people don't always understand the difference between clinical depression and grief or intermittent sadness um, that's based on an event. Um, say somebody dies and you feel grief after that and you may go into like a depression, but it's not always clinical chronic depression. It isn't with you forever. You grieve and you move on. Um, everybody's different again, but for people like me, depression is just there. It's part of who you are and it doesn't have a reason. Um, and people always ask me, is there something like in particular that's wrong? Because everybody wants something that they can fix. And I, I have to tell them, no, I mean, usually it's, it's nothing. I don't know what it is. I just feel this way. And fortunately, it, you know, it, it's up and down. It's not always low, low, low. Like I, I have been through ones that are very low for a long time and it's the scariest thing in the world. Um, but yeah, I think it's important to talk about that difference. Oh, there's this really interesting little story she tells about how she was um, tutoring a blind student. And so the, she was tutoring the student in her office and then the student one day asked if they could meet in the, um, it's like the, the blind reading room at the university. And she says, I tracked down the reading room with some difficulty and started to go in. I stopped suddenly when I realized with horror that the room was almost totally dark. 
It was dead silent, no lights were on, and yet there were half a dozen students bending over their books or listening intently to the audio tapes of the professor's lectures that they had recorded. A total chill went down my spine at the eeriness of the scene. My student heard me come in, got up, walked over to the light switch and turned on the lights for me. It was one of those still clear moments when you realize that you haven't understood anything at all, that you have had no real comprehension of the other person's world. I loved that. It's, it's just such an interesting way to say exactly what she says, that you, you really don't know what other people go through. And it's important to learn, and it's important to be open to learn. Oh, he's still on my lap. He's a happy boy. Oh, she talks a little bit about the, um, about the language. There's this chapter called Speaking of Madness, and somebody got really upset with her that she uses the word madness. Um... And then she says, One of my friends prior to being discharged from a psychiatric hospital after an acute manic episode was forced to attend a kind of group therapy session designed to be designed as a consciousness raising effort, one that encouraged the soon to be ex patients not to use or allow to be used in their presence words such as squirrel, fruitcake, nut, wacko, bat, or loon. Using these words it was felt would perpetuate a lack of self esteem and self stigmatization. My friend found the exercise patronizing and ridiculous. So, I don't really know much, I have much to say about that, but I just thought it was interesting because, yeah, there's, there are accepted terms, and especially as um, things get more, you know, PC and we try to be more inclusive and understanding, and um, it's important to not make people feel like they're some kind of, hello, like monster just because they're different. Um, I still, I don't know, it's, it's interesting that some people um, like would be okay with words that others would find derogatory. And um, as Dr. Jameson says in the book, like she prefers the term, at least she did when she wrote this, she preferred the term manic depression to bipolar, she found bipolar offensive. Um, so really it's just about, like, being human and, and talking to people like they're also human and finding out what is important to them and how to address them, how to speak about and to them. Um, it's all individual because we're not the same person, none of us are. Hello, my boy. 200, oh, we're almost done, wow. Um, oh, this is so sad. She has this whole meeting with a friend who I think isn't, like, most of her friends are doctors. Um, and she, she always gets to this point in friendships where she realizes, like, it's gonna be superficial if I don't tell them that I have manic depression. And she tells this guy, and she says, I saw tears running down his face. And al although I remember thinking at the same, at the time, that it was an extreme response, particularly since I had tried to present my manias in as light-hearted a way as possible and my depressions with some dispassion. I thought it was touching that he felt so strongly about what I had been through. Then, wiping away his tears, he told me that he just couldn't believe it. He was, he said, deeply disappointed. He had thought I was so wonderful, so strong. How could I have attempted suicide? What had I been thinking? It was such an act of cowardice, so selfish. How could somebody be so insensitive and cruel when somebody's opening their heart to them? I, it's, it's just terrible. Luckily, most of the people that she interacts with are supportive, extremely supportive, and she gets the help that she needs, um, and she's able to continue the work that she loves. He's going insane right now. Yes, look at you. It's time to clip their claws. It really is. It's been a while, I know. Okay, last one. Oh, I just liked how she was really good with her language in, in describing mania, which as I said, I haven't really read a lot about. There are still occasional sirens to this past, 
the past when before she was taking lithium, and there remains a seductive, if increasingly rare, desire to recreate the furor and fever of earlier times. I look back over my shoulder and feel the presence of an intense young girl, and then a volatile and disturbed young woman, both with high dreams and restless romantic aspirations. How could one, should one, recapture that intensity or re-experience the glorious moods of dancing all night and into the morning, the gliding through star fields and dancing along the rings of Saturn, the zany, manic enthusiasms? How can one ever bring back the long summer days of passion, the remembrance of lilacs, ecstasy, and gin fizzes that spilled down over a garden wall, and the peals of riotous laughter that lasted until the sun came up or the police arrived? So it really was just a great experience reading this book. I read it very quickly because I'm trying to get all of my reading done for this class so I can start working on the essay and working on my um, creative writing portfolio. So it was it was easy to get through quick and it was really just riveting. Um, I found her descriptions very clear and so she, she made it very accessible to the reader to understand what it was like to be manic and to have these thoughts moving so quickly that you are, you know, at one moment very, very productive and you're getting so many things done and you're not sleeping at night because you have so many ideas and then it moving into you can't even remember the last sentence that was in your head because your brain is moving so quickly. Um, just a really fascinating read, definitely recommend it. Um, this is a weird edition. Have you guys seen these Picador classics? Focus. There. Whatever. Um, they're like really thick um, covers and they they say in here they're like very, um, hello, he's caught, he's caught on my shirt. Um, they're very into talking about their books. It says, printed on high quality paper stock and with thick cover boards, the Picador classic series is also a celebration of the physical book. And I don't really like the thick cover... I don't even like saying cover boards. That just weirds me out for some reason. But I don't like how thick they are. I like a... I like my paperbacks to feel like paperbacks. And not like a weird in-between. Anyway, uh, hopefully soon I will be able to film a video on a book that's not for class. Um, but we'll see. It's about to be the most busy time ever because I have just the rest basically the rest of the month of March and the first week of April to uh, write my essay. I have to write a piece for a workshop this week um, and to edit, extend, compile stories for my writing portfolio that will be graded. And then I have the whole summer to work on my dissertation. So that'll be fun. So anyway, I will see you all next time. Do you want to say goodbye, Springer? Oh, goodness. There he is. Goodbye, everybody. Happy reading. See you next time. <laughs> oh my gosh.